6, beginning in verse 19. How then shall we live? One master, and that master is to be Jesus. Uh, the text addresses the ongoing theme of God or of things of the world. We must choose. Uh, who do we serve? Who do we pursue? What do we pursue? What's our goal in life? What's our purpose in life? What's our treasure in life? Where do we invest our time, our money, our energy? All of that. Is it God and our relationship with God? Or is it the things of the world? It's one or the other. Uh, despite what our world says, because right now religions teach us across the board, you can love God and do what you want to do. You can love God and be who you want to be. God accepts you as you are, which is not true. If he said to me, as I am, you don't need for Christ to die on the cross to change who I am as a sinner. Yes, God loves me, but God also wishes to change me to the image of his son, Jesus. So we must deal with the issue of choosing God or choosing the things of the world. He does this in, in three steps. First, the correct storage or tr of treasure, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And just follow the logic of the verse. Do not store up treasures on earth. Anything that is material is on the earth. It should not be our treasure. Do I need to list the things that can be a distraction? My list started with an F-150. Cars, boats, houses, clothes, social status, money, food, you name it. If it's part of the world, it can be a treasure and it competes with God. The fact is, everything in the universe is in a state of decay. It is rusting. It is rotting. It is going away. Nothing lasts forever in this universe. Everything is decaying. The universe itself is decaying. As it continues to spread out, it's decaying. Jesus says, don't store up treasure on earth where it will not last. He lists rust, moth, eating it, thieves. It's never always going to be mine. When I die, it's gone. All those things that I put aside and I take care of and manage the best I can, the day I die is useless to me. Uh, it can't go with me. I read a story about a rich man who... Uh, Wanted to take money with him, so he gave it to his lawyer, to his doctor, and to his pastor. Cash. He said, when I die, put this in the casket with me. It's going with me. <clears throat> so the man, sure enough, he died, and the doctor and the lawyer and the pastor came and put their envelope in the casket, and they buried it. And then they got together and asked each other, did you do that? The lawyer, no, man, I just put a bunch of newspaper clippings in there. And the doctor, I didn't need it. I kept that money. And the preacher, I gave it to him. I put it in the casket. I wrote him a check and put it in the casket. <laughs> you can't take it with you. Somebody else is going to get it. Even if you think you faithfully left it with somebody you can trust, somebody else is going to get it. It's not going to be yours. But I like to emphasize everything is decaying. Even plastic decays. Even nuclear waste decays. Everything <coughs> is decaying. It may take thousands of years, but it's not forever. And Jesus says, don't waste your time placing your treasure into something that's not going to last. It will rot. It will be eaten by moth. It will rust. Or thieves will come and take it. He says, store up treasure in heaven. Uh, what do we store in heaven? How do I store treasure in heaven? How do I put all my money into heaven so it's there when I get there? Well, of course, that's not what he's talking about. What is my heavenly treasure? And for me, the obvious answer is, it's my relationship with God. Where I am to invest my time, my energy, my efforts, my emphasis in life is in my relationship with God. Because that is eternal. That I can't lose. There are no thieves that can take it. It doesn't rot. It doesn't rust. Nothing can eat it. Now, I know there's that incorrect teaching that you can lose your salvation. That's not true because John's very clear in his gospel where Jesus says, no one can pluck them out of my Father's hand. 
Once I'm God's, I belong to God forever. For me to think I can pluck myself out of God's hands makes me stronger than God. But anyway, I cannot lose that relationship. That's my emphasis. That's my treasure. That's what I store up for heaven. There's one more item that I think we can also store up in heaven. That is our good works. Those do have results in heaven. But I think specifically those good works are leading other people to Jesus. Now, part of my heavenly treasure is my emphasis in my family's life to lead them and influence them to seek Jesus. Because I will hopefully see them there because they respond to my influence, my teaching, and what I'm, my example of what I'm saying about Jesus. So my treasure is my relationship with God, but also my treasure is leading others to have a relationship with God. Then Jesus says, where your heart is, there your treasure is. Well, is your heart in the driveway? Is that where it's parked? That F-150? Or that Volkswagen, whatever it is that moves you? Is your heart in your savings account, your portfolio? Is your heart in the mayonnaise jars you fill with money and bury in the backyard? Uh, where is your treasure? Where is your heart? And I like that connection. Your treasure is where your heart is. If my treasure is Jesus, that's where my heart is. If my treasure is material things, that's what my heart's desire is. That's what my heart is pursuing the things of the world. So it comes down to where is your treasure? Where is your heart? What are you pursuing? Are you pursuing things of the world? Or are we pursuing Jesus? It's either or. Then Jesus says something unique in this second step here. Verse 22 and 23. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad or evil, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? Don't miss the fact that that Jesus, again, in the same sermon, talks about what we look at. In 528, Jesus said, But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. In our sexuality, he talks about looking as being a key to pure sexuality, pure sexual, pure person in our heart. And now he's talking about the things of the world, which includes money, which includes possession, uh, whatever we look at, where we place our treasure other than God, the things of the world, the but eye he, is the source or starting point of that failure. Well, in reality, if I had never seen an F-150, I'd never want an F-150. If I'd never seen a boat, I'd never want a boat. If I'd never seen whatever, a 72-inch TV, I'd never want one. But when I see it, how I perceive it, how I process what I see, is the starting point to my failure of making the things of the world my treasure rather than Jesus. So don't miss that Jesus again brings us to what we look at as the starting point to our failure of replacing him with something else. That can be anything from money, cars, boats, social status, relationships, anything. All of those ideas and principles and realities enter my mind through my eyes. It's what I look at and then want. So in Hebrews it says, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and of our salvation. That's a great verse, Hebrews 12, 2. And that's where I should be fixed. It's on Jesus. Not on things of the world. And then Jesus continues, an evil eye looks with lust and covetousness. A desire to possess, own, consume. It is greed. An evil eye wants, and I think wants at all cost, and is willing to sacrifice everything in our life to achieve, obtain, and get that which we want. So the person becomes consumed with the desire to possess. The person lives for what he sees and wants. Not for Jesus, not for his family, not for anything. So he's now possessed, consumed by what the eye has seen. That is the evil eye. And an evil eye leads to the whole person being in darkness. And I know folks who have money, and they enjoy spending it. They have a new vehicle every year or two. They have all kinds of toys. They live in multiple places. They come and go as they please. And being in their presence 
you might see happiness, but there is something missing. There is that darkness. There is that void, which I think is God. Um, in John 3, verses 19 and 20, Jesus mentions the darkness. For this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And the fact is, people that live in that darkness because of their pursuit of worldly things don't want the light that is Jesus. So an evil eye is one who rejects Jesus as our purpose in life and makes the material things of the world our purpose in life. A clear or healthy eye fills the person with light because a clear, healthy eye looks to Jesus, and there we find true joy, happiness. There we find our purpose in life. The third thing Jesus points out here is you cannot serve two masters. Verse 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth or God and mammon, which is money. You cannot serve God and money. He's pretty blunt. You will love one and hate the other. So either I love Jesus and hate the world or I love the world and hate Jesus. If I live for the things of the world, I'm communicating by my actions and my desires that I love the world, therefore I hate Jesus. I can't do both. And our culture currently is teaching you can do both. You can do whatever you want to do and say you love God because God loves you no matter who you are. Well, that, that's true. God loves me no matter who I am. That's why Christ died for whoever I am. But unless I submit to Jesus as Lord... There's no salvation. There's no uh, eternal <coughs> presence with God. So I can't do both. It's either or. Who am I going to serve? Do I live for my career? Do I live to make money? Do I live to own possessions? Do I live for social status? Do I live, what do I live for? Either I live for Jesus and to know him and to walk with him, or I live for things of the world. It cannot be both. And again, the American culture has taught for the last 50 years. Abandon everything for your career. That is not biblical. That is not honor God. I have to abandon everything for Jesus, not things of the world. Therefore, who do I serve? Do I serve money? Do I serve job? Do I serve relationships? Do I serve Jesus? Where do I spend my time, money, thoughts, and desires? When I answer that question, I find my master is. And then fourth, <laughs> Jesus sums it up with some illustrations of why we should not be pursuing things of the world. Verses 25 through 34. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air, for they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single cubit, a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. For they do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown to the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? Do you have little faith? Do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus says, for this reason I say to you, don't worry about the physical life. God provides for his people. God is responsible for feeding you, clothing you, and housing you. Not you.
Are you there? God is responsible for feeding you and clothing you and housing you. God provides you job. God provides you income. God takes care of you. It is not your responsibility. Your primary goal in life is not where do I work, how much do I get paid. Your primary responsibility in life is seeking God and your relationship with God. He takes care of everything else. Not you, not your employer, not your parents, not your kids. God is your provider. He says, look at, verse 26, look at the birds. What do they do? They just go get food and come home. We have a sparrow's nest in the workshop. They got into one of the cracks in the door, and in my spare hoses for the compressor, they built a nest. And I'd get up there on the ladder, and I'd check, and at first they would pull their head back when I checked, but now they just look at me like, oh, it's you. <laughs> but they have done nothing. Everything they've needed, God provided for them as far as housing, Pretty nice house, Miss Sparrow. <laughs> There's some more birds outside in the bushes who uh, tend the bushes coming out to death. They get rained on. Sparrows don't. <laughs> he provides them food. He provides them everything. They do nothing. I sure that bird's not worried about anything. Not even snakes where he's at. Because he's safe. Jesus says, look at the birds. Do they worry about food? No. Verse 28 through 30, look at the flowers. They are more beautifully clothed than Solomon in all his glory. We know Solomon was pretty decked out. And Jesus says that flowers are better than Solomon. What do they do? They just grow. God provides everything they need. Sun, water, food, dirt, everything. God provides. Verse 27. How can you change anything by worrying? What does worry change? It only changes the health of my stomach. It creates ulcers. It doesn't make me taller. doesn't make me live longer. doesn't provide me with income. Worrying changes nothing. Jesus says, don't be anxious. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. God takes care of them. And then he says, aren't you more valuable than a bird? Don't you think God will provide and take care of that? Verse 31 and 32, the lost, the Gentiles, eagerly seek these things. They eagerly seek food, clothing, and housing. Well, my question is, are you lost? Are you going to hell? The answer is no, I'm a child of God. Then why would a child of God ever worry about food or clothing or housing or anything? doesn't mean live irresponsibly and blow everything he gives you on things you don't need. It means God provides, trusting to provide. He will take care of his children. But what we are to do, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The kingdom of God is Jesus. His righteousness is our relationship with him. My purpose in life is not my career or my family or my social status. My purpose in life is my personal, intimate love relationship with God. He created me not to be a pastor, not to be a dad or a husband. He created me to be his child, to know him, to walk with him, and be in his presence for all eternity. My goal in life is not to be the greatest preacher of all time. My goal in life is to be the greatest child of God of all time. To walk with him. Abraham's called the friend of God. What did he do? He wandered around in Palestine with some sheep and lived in a tent. He was the greatest what of all time? Wanderer, nomad, one of the greatest preacher, doctor, lawyer, builder, dad, husband. He was a friend of God. His greatest thing in life was his righteousness, his relationship with God. Mm. What Isaac did. Mm. He mm. wandered even less than Abraham did. And he is righteous before God because his relationship with God is all that was important. God did not put us here to change the world. He put us here to walk with him. If in walking with him, the world changes, fine. But our goal is not to change the world. Our goal is to know God and be in that intimate, personal love relationship with him. 
That is the single most important thing in life. Seek ye first kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he takes care of everything. Don't worry about tomorrow, he says. Tomorrow take care of yourself. Well, isn't that kind of refreshing? Tomorrow's Monday. What will our government do tomorrow? What will COVID do tomorrow? What will Russia do tomorrow? What will my neighbor have to do tomorrow with their furniture on the front yard? Don't worry about it. My focus is right now, and my you'll see it come to graduation party. You'll still be there, I'm sure. My focus is my relationship with God, not their trash in their front yard, which Michelle asked me this morning, you think you can go ask them if you can haul it away for them? <laughs> I'm not touching that stuff. Our focus is not tomorrow or what someone else is doing. Our focus is my relationship with Jesus. So I say to you, read the words of Jesus and trust him. He's saying straight up, God will take care of his children. You are his child. Trust him. Pursue him. Let him take care of the things that the world worries about and is anxious for. It's all in God's hands. Trust him. Let's pray. And Father, we do love you and praise you and thank you that you are our great provider and protector. And I thank you, Father, that you created us for one reason. That's not to grow food or make food or build a house or find clothing, but our purpose is to simply know you and walk with you and trust you. And I pray, Father, you will open our eyes to that truth and that reality, draw us to you, and affirm our purpose is you, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Yeah. No, I was saying they were